When it comes to retirement withdrawal strategies, the most popular one for many years has been the 4% rule. Originally popularized by retired financial advisor William Bengen, it serves as a solid starting point for estimating retirement savings and spending goals. However, as we've explored in the past, it does have some drawbacks. Foremost among them is its tendency to leave a lot of money on the table for most retirees. As you can see from this chart, the majority of historical starting dates have left retirees with more money at the end of a 30-year retirement period than they had when they first settled down. In fact, they usually end up with multiple times the amount of money they retired with decades before, as you can see from the average and median ending net worth figures here. And that's by design. The 4% rule is deliberately conservative with its withdrawal calculations. It's meant to survive a 30-year retirement with money to spare, even if you happen to retire during the worst economic and market environment we've experienced over the past century. As a result, if you happen to retire at any other time, you tend to end up with a little extra money once all is said and done. Most strategies that try to correct for this drawback incorporate the value of the nest egg into their withdrawal calculations. That way, if the value of your investments rise, so too does your income in retirement, which helps to balance things out. A fixed percentage withdrawal strategy is a great example of this. As you can see from this chart depicting a hypothetical retirement, withdrawing 4% of the value of your nest egg each year can certainly lead to higher levels of income, assuming your investments don't completely crater like they did during those roughest historical periods. As usual for this series, figures in the chart are rounded down to the nearest $100. The downside to this approach is that oftentimes you end up with highly variable income levels from year to year, which is great if the variability is to the upside, but not so great when you suddenly have to find a way to live on a fraction of what you did last year due to a down market, especially if that down market persists for more than a year. The other downside is, because the original 4% rule doesn't account for the value of the nest egg after that initial withdrawal is made, it tends to not quite last as long as some other strategies. In other words, the risk of outliving your savings, while not especially high, is higher using the 4% rule than it is with some other strategies. Again, take a look at the fixed percentage strategy for a good example of this. This updated chart is admittedly very extreme, but it illustrates the point. Unfortunately, the strategies that tend to do really well in the risk category usually run into other problems, like the withdrawal calculations not allowing for a high enough income to put food on the table following difficult times, as you can see from the chart, which tends to make them less sustainable over the long term. So that's the situation we're faced with. The 4% rule tends to leave a lot of money on the table, but if we try to correct for that by giving ourselves a higher income in retirement, we oftentimes tend to increase our risk of outliving our savings. If we try to adjust our approach to minimize that risk, we often end up with strategies that are a little more difficult to stick to down the road due to the fact that the withdrawals can become so variable and potentially get so low that we're no longer able to afford our basic necessities. Today, we're going to discuss a simple, yet sensible strategy that manages to find a happy medium between stronger income-generating capabilities and minimal risk while remaining relatively easy to stick to. Let's talk about the pros and cons of the sensible withdrawal strategy. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a link to the investing platform M1 Finance. Get started investing for free today. Before we get into the analysis for the approach, I want to discuss how we'll be grading strategies in this series. Basically, we'll be looking at four criteria. The first is how much income the strategy generates. More income is obviously better, but we'll also be giving a little extra credit to strategies that generate additional income early on, since we're more likely to be healthy and energetic enough to take advantage of the higher income in our younger years than we are when we're 90-somethings. Second is risk and sustainability. This criteria basically measures how likely you are to outlive your money using a strategy, as well as how easy or difficult it might be to follow the rules laid out by the strategy. The third is the predictability or stability of the income. Basically, this criteria looks at how often your income rises or falls on an inflation-adjusted basis from year to year while using a strategy, and how big those changes are. And fourth is how well the approach manages to maintain or raise your buying power over time. Which criteria will ultimately be the most important to you depends on your goals, financial situation, and preference. And because the performance of the withdrawal strategies are often heavily influenced by the mix of investments you happen to have, we'll also be looking at each approach under a conservative, moderate, and aggressive allocation, as shown by the this chart. With that being said, let's get into today's strategy. So real quick for those who don't know, here's how the strategy works. First, you choose a base withdrawal rate which is meant to give you enough money to cover your basic expenses like food, water, shelter, transportation, clothing, insurance, and so on. 
and you adjust that withdrawal amount every year thereafter for inflation, just like you would in the original 4% rule. Ideally, this withdrawal rate will be lower than the traditional 4%, because you're also going to select a second withdrawal rate to give you a boost in income during years when your investments have outpaced inflation. The creator of the FI Calc website, where I initially stumbled onto this strategy, used 3% as their base rate. So that's what I'll be using today. The second withdrawal, which I'll be referring to as the extra withdrawal rate for the rest of this video, is used to determine what percentage of your inflation-adjusted gains from the previous year will be withdrawable as income for the current year. Obviously, since your base rate already, hopefully, covers all your basic expenses, these additional withdrawals can be used to fund anything from hobbies, to travel, or any other discretionary purchase. It's kind of like the reverse budget of withdrawal strategies, because once you've got your bases covered, you're free to do whatever you want with the remainder of your income. This process is probably easier to visualize with an example. So let's say that you select 3% as your base rate, and elect to withdraw 10% of your inflation-adjusted gains in the years where your investments do well enough to have them. So your extra withdrawal rate is 10%. Here's how a hypothetical retirement could play out. As you can see, the sensible withdrawal approach starts off with lower income figures than we'd see in the traditional 4% rule, but at least in this particular hypothetical, it experienced strong enough growth that its inflation-adjusted gains eventually allowed it to out-earn the 4% rule. And you can imagine how this could play out over longer time periods. So, that's how the sensible withdrawal strategy works. But how well does it stack up in regards to our four criteria? As usual, we'll start by examining its historical income generating capabilities. The first factor I look at when analyzing withdrawal strategies is income. As you can see from the chart on your screen now, in terms of income generated on a $1 million nest egg, the sensible approach typically outperforms the $40,000 a year income that the standard inflation adjusted approach would generate when using moderate and aggressive allocations. However, it tends to give up some ground when using the more conservative allocation. I think this is largely because the moderate and aggressive allocations both have sizable explosive growth potential. By that I mean both allocations hold over half of their money in the stock market. Now, the stock market is a lot of things. It's volatile, uncertain, and a bit of a drama queen. But it's also capable of experiencing years of high double-digit inflation-adjusted returns. And that's absolutely crucial when a portion of our income is being taken from our inflation-adjusted gains. The conservative allocation we're using for this series only puts about 25% of its money into the stock market. And two of the other assets it holds, bonds and cash, which make up roughly half the allocation's weight, don't tend to produce those highly explosive returns very often. That's part of the allocation's appeal. It's much more steady, but in this particular case, it hurts its income-generating capabilities. For the record, this is exactly why I've been testing the withdrawal strategies in this series against a few different allocations. Some of them tend to perform materially different using different allocations. The story of the early years is similar, but slightly different from the original picture. The aggressive allocation, on average, still outperforms the traditional 4% rule, however narrowly. But the moderate allocation hasn't quite had enough time to build up the value of its nest egg to the point that our 10% cut of the inflation-adjusted gains are enough to lead to outperformance on a consistent basis. And of course, the conservative allocation still lags behind in terms of income. The second factor I look at when analyzing withdrawal strategies is risk and sustainability. Risk, or the likelihood that you'll outlive your savings, examines a couple of metrics. The first is what I call the approach's survival rating, or the percentage of possible retirement starting dates that would have avoided running out of money over a specific length of time. In this series, I'm using 30 years as the time frame to determine if an approach survived retirement. The second is what I call the approach's depletion time, or how long the approach survives in its worst case scenario. This is important to consider because while two approaches can have the same likelihood of making it at least 30 years, they can have wildly different worst case scenarios. Sustainability considers how easy or difficult an approach is to maintain given the experience its strengths and weaknesses are likely to produce for the retiree. Starting with the survival rating, we can see that the sensible approach shines relative to the traditional 4% rule, never once outliving its savings over a 30 year time period. This is not entirely surprising given that it's using a lower safe withdrawal rate of 3 but it's good to know that even with the more explosive growth strategies, our 10% cut of the gains were not enough to get us into trouble even when those gains were followed up by terrible bear markets. In terms of the worst case scenario, the sensible approach absolutely dominates the 4% rule, lasting a minimum of 31, 74, and 44 years using the conservative, moderate, and aggressive allocation respectively. So in terms of risk, I'd say the winner is clearly the sensible approach. 
In terms of sustainability, the sensible approach may be easier or harder to stick to depending on how you look at it. On the one hand, you do experience income drops fairly frequently, basically any year where your investments fail to keep pace with inflation after having produced inflation-adjusted gains the year prior. On the other hand, the income cut really only ever brings you back to your baseline income level. It's not like you're putting yourself in a position where you're unable to make ends meet, unless of course you experience some sudden unexpected bills, or just lifestyle creep as a result of your discretionary spending decisions, such as financing a new car with your extra withdrawal money, leading to ongoing debt payments beyond the year in which you bought the vehicle, but assuming you avoid those kinds of situations, the cuts aren't necessarily as bad as the ones you might experience with something like a fixed percentage withdrawal strategy, for instance. So I think this one largely comes down to a few factors. First is your financial situation. If you have more money than you realistically need, and are thus able to utilize a lower initial safe withdrawal rate than the standard 4% rule would allow, then that'll likely help make this approach a little bit more sustainable. Second are the returns you experience during your retirement. Obviously, if you get a good sequence of returns, that'll help to cut down on the time it takes to start out earning the traditional 4% rule, and make this approach a little bit easier to sustain for most. Third is how you look at the income cuts. This probably also ties into how flexible you are with your hobbies and how you like to spend your time, as having to delay an activity you've been really looking forward to for a little while is a distinct possibility with this approach, and if that sounds like something that might be difficult to deal with, then this approach may be more difficult for you to sustain. Fourth are what decisions you make with your discretionary income. As I just went over, if you tend to buy things that add costs to your budget going forward, this approach may become less sustainable over time, as your burn rate continues to rise faster than the rate of inflation, leading to your base withdrawals being unable to cover your basic costs down the road. In the end, it's an approach that's probably going to be more sustainable for some and less sustainable for others. Which camp you fall into is something that only you can know for sure. The third factor I look at when analyzing withdrawal strategies is the predictability stability or stability of the income stream it produces. And in this regard, even though the income stream is more variable, and thus less predictable in the strict sense, the sensible strategy is arguably just as stable. The floor of the income is going to rise, at a minimum, in line with inflation as measured by the CPI each year just like the 4% rule. It's just that in some years, the overall income will rise at a rate that's faster than inflation, and in other years the income will fall back down to that baseline level, as you can see from this chart. The fourth and final factor I look at when analyzing withdrawal strategies is buying power. And in this case, who gets the edge really depends on the investing strategy you're using and when you look. Aggressive allocations that tend to deliver stronger long-term growth have a good chance of growing your nest egg enough over time that your average buying power exceeds that of the traditional 4% rule though it is going to be anything but linear, consistent growth, and it won't manifest in every single year. More conservative approaches may struggle to generate explosive enough single-year returns to bring the overall average buying power up to the levels experienced with the traditional 4% rule, let alone in those years where the portfolio fails to keep pace with inflation. And obviously, barring some incredible growth in the early going, the buying power is likely going to be lower for the sensible strategy simply due to its lower base withdrawal rate. So, in the end, what we've got is a withdrawal approach that attempts to find a happy medium between not leaving too much money on the table and keeping risk to a minimum. It manages to do this more often than not with the investment allocations that give the investor good potential for periodic years of explosive growth, but may not do quite as well in this regard with more steady, conservative allocations. In terms of risk, it does have the clear edge over the traditional 4% rule, and is likely to be more sustainable than other low-risk approaches like a fixed percentage strategy, due to it never dropping your income below the threshold you need to cover your basic expenses. Assuming, of course, that those expenses don't rise over time at a rate that's faster than inflation. And while its income stream is highly variable on a year-to-year -year basis, you could argue it is just as stable in terms of the income floor as the 4% rule. One final potential thing to consider is that due to it having a lower basic withdrawal rate than the 4% rule, you may need to save for a bit longer before you can become financially independent while implementing this approach. A $40,000 a year budget using the 4% rule requires $1 million in your nest egg to handle. That same budget using a sensible approach with a 3% base withdrawal rate requires a nest egg of roughly $1.3 million. Not a deal breaker necessarily, but something to consider nonetheless. But what do you think? Does the sensible withdrawal approach live up to its name? Or do you feel that there are better approaches out there that accomplish what it's trying to accomplish? Let me know in the comments section below. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.